talking about that, and we sang that in conclusion to our last service, how we're going to join with the angels and with generations before us in singing the praises of Christ. And we're going to be doing that throughout all of eternity. And just as we say, come Christians, join and sing. Let's see.
blessing with humanity. The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and was and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hill. chapters in the book of Revelation? 22. What's 22 divided by 2? By the end of the day, we ought to be halfway through this book. Praise the Lord, right? All right, so we'll be halfway through the book uh, after today. Uh, pa uh, Revelation chapter 11, and you heard the reading this morning of verses 14 through verses 19, and just want to uh, review just a little bit our timeline that we have given uh, so that everybody uh, recognizes the timeline. This is the cross of Jesus Christ. This is the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have the church age, which is this period right here, up to the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church is the next, it is the next thing on God's biblical prophecy that will occur, is the rapture of the church. There's nothing else that's going to happen on here Rather than that is the very next thing on God's timeline for his church to be raptured, okay? So you got the rapture of the church, and then we have three and a half, and three and a half is seven years of tribulation period. And we've uh, delineated this here. This is the first three and a half years, and this is the last three and a half years, and those things that will happen. We are now come to the seventh trumpet judgment, Okay, we've went through, we've looked at the seven seal judgments. 
We looked at two witnesses that preached, and we looked at that last week in chapter 11. We've seen the 144,000 Jewish evangelists that will preach across the world. That's in chapter 7, and we will come back to them in chapter 14. Okay? And as I've told you before, chronologically, the book of Revelation is not set out chronologically uh, that we just say, okay, this is the next thing, this is the next thing, this is the next thing. Right now, we're going to look and we're going to take a peek into the future in these last verses of chapter 11. Okay? This is very important to understand so that you don't get confused on what's going on. We've looked at these things. Now we're at the seventh trumpet judgment. And when you have the seventh trumpet judgment blown, that includes all seven of the bold judgments or the vile judgments. It's not V-I-L-E, it's V-I-A-L, okay? V-I-A-L, the vile judgments, or uh, some refer to it as the bold judgments. Those judgments will come one right after another, after another, after another, after another. We've seen these judgments happen here. This is the trumpet judgments, okay? A third of the earth burn. A third of all sea creatures die. Stars fall. One third of waters turn bitter. One third of the sun, moon, and stars darken. Woe number one, there's three woes that are included. Woe number one was actually the fifth trumpet that sounded. And that was the woe pronounced against man. Fallen angels like locusts are released from the bottomless pit to torment men for five months under their king, Abaddon or Apollyon, which is Satan. That's the fifth judgment. The sixth judgment is the second woe. Okay? It's the second woe, it's the sixth judgment, and it's a one-third of people killed by a horseman. 200 million evil angels, there'll be a demonic invasion here, there'll be another demonic invasion here of evil angels as horsemen will kill one-third of humans. Think about that. One-third of the entire population. At this point, one-half of the population or right now, 3.9 billion with a B people will be gone. And I know that we go over this, but I really want you to understand, grab a hold of what that would mean. 3.9 billion people evaporated off of the face of the earth. Gone. It seems like there's that many people coming into our neighborhood right here, right? I mean, we got all around us. We're like, man, all these people are coming. 3.9 billion gone. There's going to be a lot of homes with nobody living in it. There's going to be a lot of land with nobody on it. I just want you to sit and just think for a minute about that. It's nothing like you've ever experienced in your entire life, no matter where you're from or where you're at. You've never experienced something like this. And this is on a global, a universal type thing that's going to happen. And we saw last week, if you're here, during this time, you are thrilled that the two that were the witnesses have been killed. You're absolutely thrilled. Because it's their fault that all of this has happened. And it's exactly what God has planned. And we've said over and over again as we look at the book of Revelation... He always, always tells you what's going to happen when judgment comes. And he gives you plenty of time to repent and to believe in him. So I don't think at this point anybody can say, could you give me a heads up? Can you get any more heads up than all of this? And then we come to what is the third woe, which is wrath and reward. It's seven vile, bold judgments of Revelation chapter 16. 
You say, but wait a minute, we're in Revelation chapter 11. You're exactly right. That's why I told you it's not chronologically set out. Remember, I told you we're going to talk about things that has happened. We're going to get in it in 12, 13, 14, and 15. That's already occurred, but it's going to be explained. So I just want to bring you up to date. The end time will be a period of horror and tragedy. And the world and its people will go through great tribulation. Tribulation such as the world has never before seen. Literally, scene after scene, you will see this catastrophe and horror that has already been placed upon the world. God's wrath is sure to come. And so it will come. Imagine what John was going through. John is writing this, and he's seeing this. And he's seeing what's going to happen. He was having to look upon those scenes and be an eyewitness to all of these horrors. And this is the reason here and throughout Revelation where we'll have a parenthetical passage. We'll have a break, if you will, that not everybody's getting destroyed and everything's happening over and over and over again. Gives you a little respite. A little, man, I need to take my breath. And he does that for John and he does that for you and me. And this is one of them. Here in verse 14, through the rest of this chapter. Verse 14 says, the second woe is past, and behold, that word behold says, pay attention. So don't just think, well, you know, that's just old King James stuff. They just throw that in there. No, the word behold means something. It means, hey, pay attention to what's going on. Because I'm telling you, this is what's going to occur. So he says, the second woe is past, and behold, pay attention, the third woe cometh quickly. It cometh quickly. By woe has been a period of extreme distress, extreme grief, extreme suffering, affliction, and calamity. And remember, there, are, there will only be three of them. Three woes. We saw them. The first one, the first woe will be the demonic locust-like creatures that invade the earth and torment people. The second woe will be demonic military horse-like creatures that sweep the earth, killing one-third of the ungodly and evil population. And the third woe is the seventh trumpet, which we come to today. The judgments that result from its blast. But note this, when the seventh trumpet blasts, there's no judgment and there is no woe that comes immediately forth. Why? Because there are some things that need to be seen before the judgment actually takes place. The judgments and woe of the seventh trumpet are actually the seven vile or bold judgments. That is, the seventh trumpet will blast forth seven more judgments and will bring history to its climax. But first, there are some things that we need to see and understand and the very first thing, the first thing is most interesting. It is an overview of the events that are yet to take place in Revelation. This passage right here in verses 14 through verses 19 leaps ahead and shows us in a broad summary what is to happen in the next 10 chapters that's ahead of us. So he writes, and God prepared John's heart for the terrible events that were yet to be revealed to him. Prepared him by showing that God would triumph over evil and he would establish his kingdom forever. And God gave John and gives us a view of what is yet to come. And this seventh trumpet will bring about a devastating wave of judgment. It will fulfill the ancient prophecies. What's one of them? One of them is found in Joel chapter 2. In the Old Testament, Joel chapter 2, verse 1 and 2 says, Blow ye the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand. 
a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds and of thick darkness, as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and strong. There hath not been ever the light, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. You see, when it sounds, the seven vile judgments are revealed. And these judgments contain the final awesome judgments and the awful judgments of God found right in Revelation 15, verse 1. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. We're in Revelation chapter 11, verse 15, and you don't get to this until Revelation 15, 1. So you say, what in the world's going on between here and there? A whole lot of things. And it's the perspective that you're going to see. And this is very important for you to understand how it's written and why it's written the way it is written. You see... Revelation 12, 13, and 14 are retelling of the tribulation story from a different perspective. In Revelation 6 through 11, the focus has been on the Lord Jesus Christ. We have learned about the process he uses to take possession of this earth. Revelation 12, 13, and 14 takes the focus off of the Lord and it places it on the Antichrist. We have been observing the tribulation from God's perspective. For the next few chapters, we will observe that awful period of time from Satan's perspective. And notice with me today, the seventh trumpet sounds. The seventh trumpet sounds, all right? Number one, as you take notes, the announcement of the kingdom. The announcement of the kingdom. Verse 15, you read these words, and the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven. Okay, just want to stop there. We want to go through this so you understand this completely. The words great voices translate the Greek words mega and phonae. P-H-O-N-A-Y. You know what we get our word is? Megaphone. Okay, megaphone. You say, where did we get that from? Well, there it is, megaphone. It refers to shouting and loud speech. This is a picture of loud, vigorous praise in glory. It's the announcement of the kingdom. And notice that I said kingdom singular, not plural. This is very important. The tense of the verb translated are become. So you see, there was great voices in heaven saying, the kingdoms of this world are become the kings of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever are become the kingdoms of the Lord. This is, this, is, this is interesting, and you wouldn't know this if you didn't study the Greek. You wouldn't have any idea. You say, well, what's the big idea? There's a huge big idea here. And I want to give you a word, and you say, oh, I don't know what that is. It is proleptic aorist. Okay, you say, what in the world does that mean? It means that it's going to be done. I don't care if you throw a fit or if you believe or not. It's going to happen, irregardless of what your thoughts are. Does that make sense? He's saying, he's acting like right here and talking like it's already happened. It's already happened. Why? Because he said it would. And he writes in a very particular way. Okay? And I just want you to see this and point this out. It describes a future event that is so certain that it can be spoken of as if it has already taken place. It's as good as done, even though it's still in the future. Christ will reign forever, indicating that once Christ begins to reign, it will not and it shall not be interrupted. The timeless heaven rejoices at the long-anticipated day when Christ will establish His kingdom had already arrived, although some time on earth must elapse before that actually happens. It hasn't happened yet. How do you know that, Pastor? You know that. Just look at our world. It's not happened yet. The parenthetical portion between the sixth and seventh trumpets has now concluded. And this is the seventh angel's trumpet, not the trump of God that sounds at the rapture of the church, before the tribulation begins. 
do not get this wrong because many people will say, okay, that's the last trumpet, that's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, and it's not. And it's not 1 Corinthians 15, 52. What do we read there? For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. That's talking about the rapture of the church. 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Who's he writing to? You shall be changed, those that have received Christ as their Savior, the saints of the church. It's talking about the rapture of the church. That's not talking about the seventh trumpet that will sound. And when the seventh trumpet sounds, soon after will be the second coming of Jesus Christ, where he will put, Zechariah chapter 4, verse 9, he will put his feet on the Mount of Olives. So understand where you're at, and don't get confused, and don't let anybody else confuse you of what God's Word is saying. It's very clear what he's saying here. When the soundings of the seventh trumpet comes, an announcement of the Im imminent rule of Christ over this world. Some additional events have to transpire before all is realized, but the end is so near now that the announcement can be made. This will bring the fulfillment of many Old Testament prophecies. What are some of them? One of them is Isaiah chapter 9. Verse 6 and 7, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. When's that going to happen? It's going to happen at the seventh trumpet. What's another one? Daniel chapter 2, verse 44. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms, and it shall stand forever. It's the kingdom that God is going to rule over. Jesus Christ will rule. Take a moment and consider all of the kingdoms that's happened before. All the kingdoms we read about in the Bible. The Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, the Romans. That idol that we talk about in Daniel, the book of Daniel that looks at all of those kingdoms and that have ruled as well as the other powers of the day today. Most of these have fallen and are no longer kingdoms of dominance. And each of these had one thing in common. The one thing was they desired to rule the entire world. They were influenced by the God of this world, Satan himself. For centuries, evil men led by Satan have ruled the world. They have denied the Lord and slaughtered those who followed him. The kingdoms, plural of this world, will not last. Jesus is coming again as King of kings and Lord of lords. He will set up his kingdom in righteousness and all will bow to him and him alone. Back in the beginning of human history, when men first began to organize in their rebellion against God, Satan attempted, he attempted at Babel to build a world society from which God was to be excluded. Now think about this. This is just history for you. Genesis chapter 11. Genesis chapter 11, we read, So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel, 
because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Any person reading any kind of history can understand why do some people talk the way they do, and some people talk the way they do, and some people talk the way they do, and some people, well, who came up with that? What was that all about? It's in Genesis chapter 11. If you don't read the Word of God, you can be ignorant of a lot of things that happen in history. The Bible has the answer. The Tower of Babel was there. This is history. It occurred. This isn't something made up. Men planned a city in a tower. The city was to symbolize their political unity and the tower their religious unity. Well, by the way, they had a cultural unity as well. You know what it was? One common language. One common language. God came down and confounded the whole thing. Man united without God was the form taken by the first apostasy after the flood. What did he directly say to do? Have kids and multiply. And what did they do? They wanted to do what they wanted to do, and they said, we aren't moving from here. We're staying right here. And he said, that's not what I told you to do. I told you to populate the world. And I'm telling some things to many of you that says, I never thought of it that way. That's not what I've been taught in school. Because many of us have been taught in school an anti-God way to think. And don't ever forget that. Because if it doesn't match up with Scripture, it's not true. So I encourage you, know your Bible. And when you know your Bible, you can know the God of the Bible who loves you with an everlasting love and cares for you. Note carefully the offer made by Satan when he tempted the Lord in the wilderness. You remember? Luke chapter 4, verses 5 through 7. You read these words, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, All this power will I give thee, and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will give it. If thou therefore wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Do you know that the Lord didn't argue and say, Hey, you know what? You're not the prince of the power of the air. He never once said that. Not once did he say that. He just said, hey, this is not it. You have to believe the word of God and who is the creator of the universe and it's God alone. And he says some things. He offered the kingdoms, the power and the glory, Satan did. And the Lord rejected the offer. He had not come for the divided, disunity kingdoms of the earth. He had come for the kingdom. And that's why we read here in the text, the kingdom of this world becomes the kingdom of our Lord. It's very important to understand that in your text, it says kingdoms. In the Greek, the original written word is singular, it's not plural. It's singular. It's not multiple kingdoms, it's the kingdom. And God is coming for the kingdom. The entire unity of all kingdoms rolled into one. 
That is the theme of heaven's song. But it's wonderful. If it's wonderful news in heaven, guess what? It is woeful news in the earth. For the transition will take place not by evolution, but by divine intervention in wrath by God. The kingdom is to be imposed on men by God, and terrible judgments lie between the crowning of the king in heaven and the crowning of the king on earth. Satan, although he's fighting a losing battle, will not relinquish without a fierce struggle. And he'll do all he can. His rage is all the more intense. Why? The beast is riding high. And we'll get into this in chapter 12, chapter 13. It seems that his ancient goals are about to be realized, and Satan thinks he's going to win. And mankind that falls for Satan's lies thinks that they're going to win as well. Ever since the Garden of Eden, you and I have been tempted to take of the forbidden fruit that Satan offers to say that you can be God yourself. From that day until now, it's always, always, always been a lie. It's never been the truth. Never. And the big deal to you and me is, he is the king. I'm not and you're not. And you will never be, and I will never be the king. He alone is the king. And he tells us the truth. Always. And as we learned in Sunday school this morning in James, there is no variation. There's no shadow of turning. He does not change his mind. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And that's great news. So first of all, we see the announcement of the kingdom, but we're going to move on. Number two, I want you to see the adoration of God. The adoration of God. The adoration of God. In verse 16 and 17, And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats fell upon their faces and worshipped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. As soon as the angel gave a glimpse into the future that showed the victory of God, the 24 elders fell on their faces before God. First thing you're going to say is, Who's the 24 elders? We went over this in Revelation chapter 4, verse 4, when they were very first introduced. I believe with all of my heart, and I could be wrong. You like that? I believe with all my heart, but I could be wrong, and I won't argue with you. I believe, number one, that it's saints, and I believe it's the saints of the Old Testament as well as the New Testament. There were 12 tribes of Israel there were 12 apostles in the New Testament. Last I looked, and you're a math major, 12 and 12 is 24. Can't get around it. So those 24 elders, I believe, is the church. It's those that have been redeemed. I believe it is the saints of God. That's what I believe it is. You may believe it's something else, but I can tell you what it's not. It's not angels. So wherever you go, it must be a human beings. And there's some reasons for that, and we won't go into that, but I talked to you about that when we were in Revelation 4, verse 4. 
So I just encourage you, understand, here they are, the four and twenty elders, which sat before God on their seats, fell upon their faces and worshipped God. They first of all, three things, they praised God as the Lord God Almighty. Lord, he deserved to be the Lord and master, the ruler over all of life. He's God. He was the creator and maker of all. He was the only one who deserved to be worshipped. He's almighty. He was omnipotent. That is all powerful. He can do anything and he will always be able to execute his will. You may want to come on Wednesday night and figure out what that is. His sovereign will? His moral will? His individual will? That's the three, right? He will do what he wants to do. Why? Because he's Lord God Almighty. Secondly, they praised him as the Lord God who is and was and is to come. That is, he is eternal. He's the one existing now who has always existed and is always going to exist he has always been, is now, and will always be. The Lord God possesses life forever and ever. Therefore, he is able to give life to whom he wills. And thirdly, they praised him for taking his great power back from the world and beginning to reign in his rightful place. You see, God has allowed Satan to have access to the world and to man. And most unfortunately, man has chosen to follow Satan instead of God. But not all people. Some people have done exactly what God was after, freely chosen to believe and follow him. Freely chosen to love God supremely. And the result has been a worldwide inhabited by a mass of people who deny and ignore God with only a few people who choose to focus upon God. And do we not see that today in our universe? And the inevitable has happened. The selfishness and greed and lust that grips people who focus only upon self has literally consumed our world. The world is wrecked with so much sin and evil that problems have become so mammoth that they appear to be unsolvable. But that's exactly where God shows up. God is going to solve them. And this is the declaration of the praise of the 24 elders. They have just witnessed the scene of the future, the scene where God has just taken back his power over the world from Satan. They have witnessed the rule of God's love and righteousness upon planet Earth. So what's the reaction to the crowning of the king? Well, number three, the anger of the nations. The anger of the nations. Verse 18 says, And the nations were angry, and thy wrath has come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them, which destroy the earth. Literally means which corrupt the earth. It's not talking about tree uggers. I'm sorry, it's not. That, that's, you can't go there. These are people who corrupt the earth. How do you corrupt the earth? By doing what you want to do rather than what he wants you to do. Hmm. My goodness. That includes me. Now you're getting it. Now you're understanding. And the only way that that can't include you is if you receive his righteousness and his grace and you say I'm not my own I've been bought with a price so what's he say is going to happen he always tells us this verse seems to be a continuation of the words of the elders it seems to be that way and in Christ's accomplishment of taking the reins of government 
nations will be angry, the wicked dead will be punished, and the righteous will be rewarded. What makes heaven happy makes the world angry, and this anger explains that hostile attitude of the world towards Christianity. They get upset when God is honored and glorified. And you see that all over our world today. Two things. Number one, the retribution of the sinners. The retribution of the sinners, and secondly, we'll see the reward of the saints. But first of all, the retribution of the sinners. Even in tribulation, the world remains angry and defiant toward God. They will oppose and reject the Lord's offer of salvation until the very end. And rather than seeing themselves as they are, sinners in need of a holy God, they curse and they deny Him. And this verse sadly reminds us of the great white throne judgment that we'll see in chapter 20, verses 11 through 15. Our world today is filled with those who reject Christ. They live as they please, indulge in sin, and expect to answer to absolutely no one. What's that famous saying? Payday is coming. Payday is coming. The Bible warns of coming judgment for those who reject Christ. The Lord will have the final word in judgment. There won't be any arguments. There won't be any accusations against the Lord. These will stand without defense as judgment is pronounced, resulting in eternal death, separation, and torment apart from God. Jesus died for all men, but those who deny him will end up in the place called the lake of fire. All whose names are not found in the book of life will stand accountable for their sin, and what a terrible time to stand before God facing the penalty of sin. I am so glad that my sin is covered by his blood and I have eternal life in him and through him. I'm grateful and thankful. And all of those who are at this scene in heaven are rejoicing for the same thing. The reward of the saints. You see, As the lost are judged for sin, the redeemed are rewarded for their services unto the Lord. The verse mentions servants, prophets, saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great. No one will be left out. Our service down here may go unnoticed with little gratitude or encouragement. Don't ever forget this, friend. Jesus hasn't forgotten One thing, never a nanosecond. He's not forgotten anything that you and I, in his name, have ever done. That's a wonderful thought. He will reward you for every deed you've done for his glory. Every sacrifice, every faithful deed, every prayer, every encouraging word, every expression of love, all remembered and rewarded by the Lord. Revelation 22, verse 12, and behold, there's that word again, behold, pay attention, wake up, watch, listen, and behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. Jesus says, behold, I'm coming quickly. And I'm going to reward every man according to his work. The last thing we see is the ark in heaven. The ark in heaven. Verse 19 says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. And there were lightnings, and voices, and thunderings, and an earthquake, and great hail. As you look at Revelation chapter 11, 
Verse 1 says, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. Go to the last verse. And what do we see again? In the temple of God. You see, this chapter opened with a temple on the earth, but now we see the temple in heaven. That there is a temple of God in heaven is not surprising since the tabernacle was constructed after a pattern of things in the heavens. Where do we see that? Hebrews chapter 9, verse 23. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. Than these. The worship of God on the earth in the tribulation temple has been defiled by the beast, the Antichrist. In the heavenly temple, the ark is seen at this point shining through, as it were, the lightnings, the voicings, the thunderings, earthquake, and hail. The ark was the place of the presence of God. And a reminder of the faithfulness of God. Here, just before the outpouring of final judgment, is a reminder of God's faithfulness to his own people. This verse almost seems out of place in this chapter. In fact, some people believe that it ought to be in the next chapter at the beginning of the next chapter. It just doesn't seem to fit with the seeming uh, rejoicing in heaven that's going on. But this verse is important. You see, the mention of the temple places us back on Jewish ground. You see, the church does not have a temple. We are the temple. First, we see the acceptance of the redeemed. The acceptance of the redeemed. What's he say? Verse 19, and the temple of God was opened in heaven. This speaks of the acceptance of the redeemed. We will have access to the throne of God. In the original temple, there was a veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the temple. When Jesus died, the veil was rent in twain. The separation is gone because of redeeming blood. And we will be able to approach the th throne and worship our Lord and Savior. Consider a lowly sinner with nothing of value within ourselves being able to enter the very presence of God. We certainly don't deserve it, but praise God, we will experience it one day. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. First, the acceptance of the redeemed, but also the assurance of the Jews. He goes on, he says, and there was seen in this temple the ark of his testament. The ark of his testament. The temple of God was opened, and there was seen in the temple the ark, and here we find yet another reminder that God isn't finished with his covenant people. Why? The ark of the covenant was where God dwelt. It represented his presence, his power, his promises. God is reminding Israel that he will keep his covenant with them and fulfill his plan. He's not done. But also, finally, the affliction of the world. The affliction of the world. The passage closes with a vivid reminder of coming judgment. And there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Those who have rejected the Lord will face the horrors of the seventh trumpet. And as each vial is poured out, the judgment intensifies. Friend, we serve a holy God. He's a God of mercy and love, one who is long-suffering, but his mercy won't last forever. He will judge sin for who? But those who choose to reject the Lord in tribulation, the vile judgments will be theirs. 
So you come down to it and you say, okay, who's pictured here? There's two groups of people pictured. There's the saved and there's the lost. This is a picture into the end. I ask you one question. Which group are you in? There's no purgatory. There's no holding place. You are either saved or you are lost. If you're saved, you won't have to go through any of this judgment. God promised it. I didn't. Take his word for it. But if you're lost, you're given this moment right now to give your life to Him, to receive what He has done for you, and ask Him to save your soul. He's the only one that can do that. Your dad can't do that, your mom can't do that, your grandparents can't do that. Your uncle and your aunt, as nice as they may be, they can't do that for you. Your brother, your sister, they can't do that for you either. I love you, friend, and I would do that in a heartbeat for you, but I can't. Only God can save your soul. And he's long-suffering, not that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. And he continues to allow you to make the decision. But there is a point of where he says judgment has come. He did that when the flood came with Noah. He did that at the Tower of Babel where he spread everybody all over the place. He's going to do that again, and he tells us, I'm coming. My son is coming. Seven years prior to his coming to earth, he will take his bride, his building, his army, his flock, his sheep, and they will be caught up. Just like he says in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Just like he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. They will be caught up. And you may be here this morning, you say, yeah, when that occurs, I've heard you say that many times, when that occurs, that's when I will believe. Let me tell you, based upon God's word, you will not believe. You're believing the lie right now. You will not have a chance to believe. You say, how can you be so dogmatic about that? Only one reason. It's because of what he says. Second Thessalonians, he said, I will send strong delusion that you will not believe. So I beg of you now. Trust him now. And you don't have another thing to worry about. But if you don't trust him, you have every reason to be scared out of your skin. Because what we said will happen what we've been studying, it will occur. So I encourage you,
Stop believing the devil. Start believing the Lord. And ask Him to change your life.